Uh, welcome, everybody. Excited to have you all here. I know a few folks will be trickling in uh, today. Very excited to welcome June from User Evidence. We're going to be chatting about scaling customer communications, especially in the channel around Slack, uh, which is a world in which Thena also plays. For those that don't know me, I'm Mike Molinay. I am one of the founders of Thena, previously founder of Branch.io, which was a mobile linking measurement platform. Uh, Thena is a B2B customer engagement platform built for the modern era, which is really meant for helping companies scale their customer engagement, support, customer management, and success on Slack. Um, so thrilled to have June here from User Evidence, who's head of CX. Uh, June, could you introduce us just a little bit to User Evidence uh, and then a little bit about your role, and then we'll dive in. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Mike. Happy to be here and be talking about this topic today. So user evidence is a tool for B2B marketing teams to create customer stories at scale. So we allow folks to proactively capture feedback from their happy customers and then turn that feedback into an arsenal of verified marketing content like testimonials, stats, case studies. And we work with some great companies like Gong, Pendo, Coupa, and GitLab to really unlock that voice of the customer for their teams. So in my role as head of customer experience, I oversee our customer success team, uh, as well as our support, and also a bit of our customer education as we try to scale uh, our one-to-many efforts. So I work directly with our champions, our end users, to ensure that they're seeing value from user evidence. Uh, and a lot of that work is happening in Slack. So excited to be here with Mike and Thena today. Cool. Well, thank you for joining us. Thrilled to have you. Uh, for those that are tripling in, so you can use the Q&A throughout. If you have questions, feel free to drop them in there. We will start to incorporate some of those throughout. Uh, but June, would love to get started with just getting a baseline understanding of your experience with the user evidence, but really just over time, how you've seen uh, kind of customer communications and support scale and change over the last five, 10 years. And maybe you can touch a little bit upon kind of what you've seen as the foundation and then where you, what trends you've noticed change over the last few years. Definitely. So context, I've been at user evidence for a year. And then before that, I actually worked at a company called Guru, which is a knowledge management tool. I led our support team. Uh, in both those roles, I've been early customer facing hires. So uh, in my role currently at user evidence, I was actually employee five. I was the first person post sales to join. Uh, before that, our two founders were managing all of our customer relationships. One big thing uh, that I really valued coming in to both my roles, but I think here, uh, we have really created and emphasized customer relationships. I think customers are at the core of our business in terms of taking their feedback and using that to improve our product, turning our customers into our own advocates for more sales and demand gen, right? Like I, I think uh, we're also trying to drink our own champagne in terms of our product and our ethos that your own customers probably can sell better than, than you can uh, in a lot of ways. And thinking about how social proof and really cultivating those relationships play such a key role in a business. And so uh, when I joined, uh, there were about 30 customers that we had enterprise to SMB, and now we have over 100. And we actually manage a majority of those uh, in Slack. And I think a part of the reason we've been able to cultivate such meaningful relationships uh, has been because we can communicate asynchronously in a maybe more casual manner. Of course, we are still communicating over email, over Zoom, uh, and over other communication tools, right? But Slack, I think, is still very much at the core of that and allows at least me to have a more personal relationship with my customers. Um, this is something I also saw in my last role in, as a support leader. Uh, I came into an organization like Guru that was actually really customer-centric. We use live chat and Slack. And uh, I was finding that in order to have those, again, like those one-to-one meaningful business relationships and also cultivate maybe a more personal relationship as a CS leader, uh, it can be, I think, really useful to have, like to make it human, right? And I, th I think that um, we were big fans of Intercom at Guru. Um, and I think one of their core pillars is, okay, keeping 
business personal or making it um, just a little bit more human. And I think Slack obviously does a really good job at that. Uh, and so in terms of just trends I've seen, I think people want to be working with other great people, right? And I think that's the core of any business is, especially in customer success and support, uh, is that you want to know that someone's on your team, whether that be your client, your vendor. Uh, and I think communication channels obviously so key to that, especially in this sort of post-COVID era where I think the default or the lowest common denominator is actually Slack or email, right? It's not in person as much anymore. Uh, I think having that more personalized connection, that more human connection is really important. So um, yeah, I think that's sort of the trend I've seen, right? Is I think we've moved a little bit away from more stodgy, email, like in-person, maybe like field marketing being the, the forward thinking view. And I think we've moved more towards, okay, I actually want social proof for something before I buy it. I want to try something before I buy it. I want to know that the company I'm aligning myself with or trying to partner with is also similar to me or on my team or um, like is personal, right? And it is thinking about not just this tool that I'm using, but also our relationship. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my, my, my thought around that topic. I think even kind of weaving an AI to that is an interesting thought too, around how we can keep things human with that additional layer of AI. But um, yeah, that's, that's sort of my, my vantage point on all the things you talked about, Mike. Yeah, there's, I think there's a few things I want to touch on there. But one of the first things you said was you you have historically just always liked to emphasize customer relationships. And just a, a caveat or a side note here, um, for everyone listening, we became customers of user evidence, actually, because we loved what they were doing. And shout out for user evidence, basically enabling companies to leverage customer relationships to really provide social proof to everyone else. It's been immensely impactful for us. Um, when you think about kind of emphasizing those customer relationships, what do you see people doing well these days? What do you see people maybe not doing so well or ignoring when it comes to building those customer relationships? Anything come to mind? Yeah, I, I'm um, one team I work with really closely is coming to mind. I work with Bill.com. So they're an accounts payable tool used by a lot of small to medium sized businesses. Uh, they have a stellar customer advocacy team and referral program just um they're not paying me to say this, uh, but, but I work with awesome. one of our champs, Janet, I think number one, she does a really good job. So she's on the customer advocacy, customer marketing team. She does a really good job at following up with folks one-to-one -one and uh, through email or actually through video, she'll say, like, it's great to meet you. Thank you for being an advocate. And I think that additional touch point, again, it's like a very personalized touch point that she has with all of these folks that she's already uh, establish a relationship of, oh, they're raising their hand to write a review or do a video testimonial. But I think she goes that extra mile of saying, this is who I am and this is who you're working with outside of maybe your other touch points at the business, right? Um, and yeah, I think she's doing an awesome job. She, uh, we were just working together on making sure she brings these customer stories back to her sales team as well, right? So I think she's like an internal champion for Bill's Bill's customers and saying, these customers are finding so much value from our tool. They're saving so much money and time. Sales team, like use this. This is a really powerful library and arsenal that you can use um, that isn't just Bill's word, right? It's their customer's word. And so I would say two things she does well is she's making it personal. And also she's championing those stories internally and really um, being the advocate for their customers. I love that. I love that. And I, at Branch, I oversaw the, the CS team as well and was a huge fan of emphasizing customer relationships because those are the people that move on to other companies and bring you with them if they really like using you, if they feel they have a great relationship. Uh, they talk to other people, whether it be direct re references or really often back channel or kind of indirect references. So Big, big fan of that. So let's talk a little bit about how you engage and communicate with your customers. So I heard a couple of different things. Uh, we'll come back to Slack in a bit, but I, you know, heard email. Uh, also, email can be, you know, private emails directly to maybe a CSM, a CX person, a support person. It can also be in the email ticketing system like a Zendesk, a Freshdesk, a Service Cloud. 
Uh, you mentioned also live chat, having previously used intercom. Uh, maybe we can touch on those a little bit. Let's touch on uh, how you've thought about that building the CX function at user evidence, and then that can lead us into how you're using Slack today with a lot of your customers as well. Yeah, I uh, I came across Dina actually because I was evaluating uh, support tools for our team. Um, I mentioned earlier, I've been here just over a year and we've grown tremendously uh, in terms of just our active user base and also just the number of companies that we've onboarded. And I, I was noticing Slack was breaking a little bit. So context into how we onboard and kick off customer uh, success plans with folks. So once the sales team closes the deal, uh, we as a team uh, will then do a handoff. And there's often actually in that handoff, a Slack channel created. So it'll include uh, the AE that closed the deal, me, and then the CSM, and then any champions that were directly involved. And then we'll actually use that channel uh, to plan the kickoff call. And so there's usually this transition from email to Slack that happens actually during that. Um, but now, okay, we are in Slack together and we can coordinate when we want to have a kickoff call, what the pre-work needs to be, what any deadlines or must-haves are from the client side and so that we're all prepared. Uh, and then we'll do a live kickoff call on Zoom to meet each other, build that rapport, talk about any key metrics or just key outcomes that they're thinking about for their marketing programs. And then all of that implementation and onboarding will happen either asynchron asynchronously in Slack or we'll do follow-up Zoom calls. Um, and so I think number one, this creates a lot of transparency across stakeholders, right? Because there's likely a tactical person that the CSM at our, on our side is working with yet there still needs to be transparency from me and also our executive team into how the customer is doing. And on their end too, I think their executive sponsor or uh, maybe their executive decision maker wants to see that things are moving along but may not need to be involved. And so um, that process I think has been quite smooth. Uh, and then there's also just support tickets or just sort of educational issues that will come up, right? Like people are new to our software tool and there are things that they're going to need to learn. And then they dive in and they say, oh, wait, but I have this question or how do I do that? Uh, and very often that will happen in Slack too. Like they'll send a screenshot or send a video and things can happen more asynchronously that way. And we can sort of track or swarm the issue. Um, sometimes there will be bugs, right? And I need to loop in our engineering team and having that log right in Slack or right in our thread makes it a lot easier for me to say, ah, okay, actually this is what our engineering team needs to see versus this is what can get triaged with our CS team. Um, and so that had been happening, I think, a lot in, in Slack. We were we use HubSpot as our CRM. And so I naturally actually took a look at Service Hub. Uh, and what I found, or <clears throat> I think the decision point where I was like, ah, this might not be right for us right now, uh, was just a little bit like the rigidity around it or the, the lack of, uh, I, I think it was, it felt like too hard of a switch to go straight into ticketing. Uh, just based on what our status quo was and based on how our customers knew us um, and also just based on the size of our team, right? It would be, I think, a little remiss to say, okay, talk to your CSM in Slack, but also your CSM is going to answer your support ticket. So then it's like, ah, okay, well, where do you go for what right now? Uh, and so I think that eventually as we grow and we're going to have probably thousands of active users a day. We're going to need a ticketing solution as well. Um, but I think for right now, and just the trajectory that we're at, we don't need one uh, because of what Slack can really, an email and Zoom can really do. And so, yeah, I think that that will come eventually, but I, I see it sort of being delayed just based on where our customers are, uh, how we're able to meet them there, and then also the service that we're able to provide and the value that they're able to see from what we're currently doing. Cool. And when you say ticketing system, you really mean kind of like a legacy email ticketing system, like a, the HubSpot service desk, the Zen desks of the world, the fresh desks, right? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, where you are submitting a ticket and you have a question, then you wait and you get a confirmation. You say, yeah, your ticket's been received. Expect a response within 24 hours, right? That just feels 
not within our culture as a company and also the culture that we're building with our customers. Yeah. Um, yeah. The other nuance with our product too, is that you may have a lot of questions and you're not actually in the app. So like I've thought too about in-app chat and um, an in-app more asynchronous or more um, in the moment type of experience. But I think a lot of the work that, especially during onboarding and implementation that we're doing is not happening right in the app, at least in that moment, uh, especially with like executive decision makers, right? If some folks that are the buyer may not actually sign into our app very often, if at all. So, uh, but, but they're going to be in our Slack channel in our email threads on zoom. So that's a, a nuance, I think, to our tool perhaps, but uh, yeah, it, that I think played a, a key, key role in that decision. Cool. And what would you say the breakdown is or rough percentages in terms of the number of questions and conversations that you have in Slack versus maybe email with your customers? Yeah, I was trying to crunch some numbers. It's tricky when email doesn't have analytics as much. Uh, I would say, I would say about 80% of our customer communications are in Slack and 20% are in email. Uh, and I think it has to do with actually some of our customers use Teams, which sometimes when they say that, I'm like, oh no, you use Teams, which is okay. Um, not to bash Microsoft, but um, most of our even enterprise customers like Bill.com, who I re referenced earlier, they're a public company, they, they use Slack. Uh, and so I would say, yeah, it's a majority. And then the 20% over email, um, sometimes actually we, we multi-thread, right? Like we actually have a Slack channel and email and it becomes a way to get people's attention in different ways, right? For renewal conversations or for upsell and cross-sell. So yeah, I, I would say majority is happening in Slack and then email tends to be um, more few and far between, but just really dependent on the, the company and also the relationship or who the person is. I do want to come back to the challenges and benefits of Slack in general, but first I want to kind of lay out what I've seen uh, across a variety of different companies. And I want to kind of learn a little bit more around exactly how, how you guys think of this is there's kind of three main phases that I've seen companies break down the customer life cycle into. There's the pre-sales process of kind of the implementation phase, and there's the ongoing post-sales process. A lot of companies have started using Slack in the kind of across all three, it sounds like you guys use it more on the once a deal closes, then implementation, and then you guys keep the channels open for post sales as well. Have you seen Slack at user evidence or even at Guru used in the pre-sales process as well? Or is it typically only used or has it only been used for you at least just when the contract is signed? I see it in pre-sales too. So we, as a product, uh, we don't have right now have the concept of a try it before you buy it or more of a trial, like a free trial experience. Well, we're, we're working towards that. I think that's one of the goals um, for this year and next year is to be a little bit more product led and let you try it before you buy it. But right now, actually, we have this um, idea of like a proof of concept. So uh, if a company is trying to make the case for budget or just wants to see it in action because some folks, I think um, we're displacing a status quo that is very often very manual. So people, this is new technology and just a new process for them. We do give them that opportunity to try out our, our tool and it's very handheld, right? With an account executive, with someone on CS. And so we will have that Slack channel open and created and say, hey, let's coordinate here because it becomes quite tactical. Obviously the business decision has a shorter time window than say an annual contract, but um, we do find that it speeds things up. Um, it, I think more often than not, improves the likelihood of the deal closing because they see, oh, wow, this is how this company works. And also the time to response is a lot faster and we can get a lot more of a personal handheld experience. So uh, yeah, it, it does come up with the pre-sales process, very often late stage deals, right? That we think, uh, okay, are, are they serious? Or do they actually want to do this? And I would say like when the Slack channel is created, I think that the, the general consensus is, okay, we think the deal's closing, right? From, from both our perspective and also the customer or the, the prospect. Um, but I think at that point, it's like, 
we're trying this, we're like test driving and we definitely want to drive this off the lot kind of thing. Makes, makes total sense. Yeah. And I'll just share a couple kind of thoughts here because I've seen a variety of different companies do it differently. And then I want to get into some of the challenges that Slack also creates for you. <clears throat> so companies definitely do it differently. Gary, I see your comments too in the, in the Q and a section. Uh, a lot of companies have done it during maybe Slack channels during implementation and then close them down or maybe during a specific deliverable or project, um, which can be good and bad. Uh, I think that part of that is driven by the fact that having Slack channels with customers can create challenges, can create issues, especially at scale. And June, you mentioned something earlier, which is when we originally got connected, uh, you were starting to think about how do I solve this at scale? Because you, you mentioned earlier, your customer growth, the user evidence is growing so much and Slack channels historically have been hard to scale um, as the customer base grows. And that's where kind of Athena came in to help you guys solve that. But we'd love to touch on some of the risks or the challenges that you've seen at scale with Slack channels, and then we can talk about some of the benefits that uh, or solutions that you've you've seen. So maybe we can hit on some of the challenges with Slack. Yeah. One challenge I I'm starting to see here, and I saw a lot at Guru in my last role, is Slack's noisy, right? And I think Slack knows it's noisy, <laughs> uh, and I think like any good software tool, I think you need to keep it organized and make it work for you. And that can look different, right? So for me, that looks like organizing my channels in different folders, snoozing things, creating like the four later um, action items, right? I actually really like that feature now that way you can save things for later and kind of cross it off more of like a task management tool. Um, I also, yeah, I, I think that some companies use Slack for really fun things, right? Like connecting with their coworkers, using it as more of a digital water cooler or like that, that HQ where they're trying to keep things light and stay connected. And then on top of that, you're doing business in Slack, right? Like you're doing customer communications, you're doing project work, implementations, engineering, bug triaging, right? Is all happening in the same place. And so one risk I think is, just having all of those super blended together can make for a really busy workspace. Mm -hmm. And I think it can be very hard to try to get to this inbox zero mindset, right? And so I would say that that just poses risks for companies as they grow, but then also probably also like as a CS leader, I always think about burnout and trying to balance all the things that customers need and ask of you and also the business. So that's one risk. Um, on a more tactical level, something I'm noticing, a lot of my customers will DM me, which is good. Uh, and we'll have co conversations <clears throat> around like quick action items they need or quick ideas they wanna th throw my way and we can brainstorm. And more often than not, it's like a really positive thing. But then I think things can get lost or it's hard to then forward that and say, ah, actually, I want this to go out to the wider channel. I want my team members to swarm on this. I want visibility into this. Uh, and I want to like share this out, right? Um, and so things can get lost in DMs. And then I, it, it's easy to nudge people to say, ah, actually, can you post this in the channel? Like, I want our CEO to see this. I want Miles, our new VP of CS to see this. And it becomes easy to coach, but it's just something that you can't always control or like redirect, right? It's not, it doesn't have the same uh, notion of like an open inbox or a shared inbox situation that email or other ticketing and chat tools can have. So that's something I'm thinking about as we grow, right? Because for every one DM I get, I bet other CSMs are getting two more DMs and then you kind of grow and it becomes more unwieldy. And so there is this element of, of change. And I think coaching that you have to have with your customers. Cool. Some of the other things that I think you and I have experienced or chatted about too, is it's easy to forget like Slack, it tends to be very ephemeral and customer asks a question and you're, you click into the channel, you look at it, but then you get a, a message, you click into that other message and you forget where that other channel was. Um, that's been, that's been one uh, that I think we've, we've experienced as well. And then mixing communications, you talked about kind of collaboration as well earlier. It's one of the benefits of Slack, but can also be one of the challenges too. 
but you talked about kind of collaborating with other teams, product engineering, your CEO. Um, can we touch on that just for a minute? Because I meant to come back to that earlier, which is um, how do you guys tend to collaborate on customer issues internally? And then what's been the feedback of Athena and Slack in general with customers with the broader product and engine team? Yeah, I think CS and product and CS and sales, we should all be best friends. At a company, right? I think uh, you want to be working really cross functionally to serve your customer. Uh, with our product and end team, something I've really valued from their perspective is they always love to hear directly from our customers. And then I can, I feel lucky because I'm in that messenger position of being able to share the good and the bad, right? Uh, and so with our product team, we do have a bug tracking system. We actually use linear, um, which I really like. Uh, but before it makes it into linear, very often there are bugs where we need to have a conversation or a customer services something. And then there's this layer of troubleshooting that ha happens, right? Uh, and we turn our support brains on a little bit more and we say, okay, is this a bug? Let's chat about it with product or engineering let's decide if this actually should go into the backlog and get triaged and then get put into our, our two week sprints. And so a lot of that is happening right in Slack. And a lot of the times I'll link from our customer, our customer channels are almost always open. Our engineering team's not in them, but what's nice is I can link to it and they can see it and they don't have to join the channel, but they can directly hear from the customer and say, ah, wait, this is what the customer said. It's not me translating it. It's exactly what they said and what they experienced. What could they be doing wrong or what could be happening? Uh, and so I think it's number one, really good for engineering to see that, okay, there are real people and real customers that they're serving, that the bug is impacting and that their work is impacting both in like, ah, uh, there's a deficiency, there's a bug, but also with new feature releases too, actually. I very often say after we've, released a really exciting feature. Like we just came out with um, these custom case studies where we've been able to create a customer story right from a survey response. And you can actually infuse some chat GPT into it. Uh, our customers were really excited about it. And I can share that right back with our product team from Slack. I don't have to take a screenshot. They can see it and they can see it right from the channel. Right. Um, and that helps actually with our sales team too. And our leadership team, they love kind of hearing that feedback loop come back. Uh, and so I would say it just in, increases the collaboration, transparency, and also the humanness of their jobs. Because I always think like product and engineering very often don't get that one-to-one -one relationship that CS does, right? Like they don't get the chance to really build those. And I, I feel lucky because I'm actually just sharing usually the good news <laughs> and I'm not the one doing the fixing or doing the building always. And so I think it just helps make the product and engineering teams customer centric in terms of what they're doing and what uh, they're able to influence. Uh, and so in those ways, I think having, having those things in Slack makes it a lot easier for me. Yeah. And I think striking the right balance of having them visible in Slack, having the product and team being able to see it, but also not them needing to be in the channel with customers, which can get very dangerous, as I'm sure you've experienced and I've personally experienced as well. So even here, we we try to make sure that the product and engine team stay out of the customer Slack channel, but we're collaborating on an internal channel, which I believe you guys mostly do as well. Yeah, we, we have one channel, like a product CS channel where we'll funnel in all the customer issues. And I know you all do like an internal user evidence channel or internal whatever customer channel. We haven't gotten there quite yet, but I could see that actually being really useful for especially our enterprise customers or if we're building something custom yeah. uh, for someone. Um, but right now, just given our, our size, it's just in in one like product CS collab channel. Yeah, and that's it's the way we do it here now. It took us, you know, getting to maybe a hundred channels before we split that. And even that branch, what we did was for the larger clients, we would have an internal channel specific to that that customer. Um, but then we also had the centralized CS or sales channels as well, where maybe we talk about earlier stage customers or prospects or smaller ones. Um, 
So we'd love to shift gears a little bit, talk a little bit about the ways in which you've tried to solve some of the challenges, the ways in which you use Thena and some of the value you've got out of it for folks that I know there's some folks on the call that already use Thena and they can always learn best practices as well as some folks that haven't, or maybe they use Slack in some cases, but would benefit from hearing some of the solutions to the challenges that come up with Slack. So tell us a little bit about the ways in which you, you use Thena coupled with Slack. One key piece that I found has been really helpful is embedding, adding Thena to the channel as a part of the account or the channel creation process. So just doing it right off the bat. Uh, and I think that number one, that makes it easy because it gets bundled in with everyone else that's being invited. And so uh, people, actually no one has ever been like, what is this thing? Uh, because it's just a part of the channel, right? It's like there from the get go. Uh, and then it also, I think, allows us to manage notifications and any escalations immediately. Uh, and so I actually really live by that notifications channel. I have an Athena notifications uh, channel to set up for all of our customers and then also just my customers that I'm managing. So I can have two separate areas to see, okay, this is what other people are working on just so I can know what's happening. Uh, and then also just for, for me specifically. So those are the higher priority ones. Uh, one thing I've found really helpful about the, the broader notifications channel is just because our CS team is so collaborative, I do want to know what's going on, but not probably in the moment. Mm -hmm. So it's something I do is I'll read things in order of urgency, right? Or like I, it, for me, it's two buckets of urgency. Uh, and what's nice too, is Thena will pick up things that happen in threads. And so even if I don't see something that lights up in a channel, I can tell that Thena was looking at the thread and be like, ah, okay, I should learn from what Tom on my team was doing or miles on my team was doing. And I probably would have missed it. Honestly, if Thena wasn't there to give me the notification, um, you talked earlier about forgetting Slack messages or things being ephemeral. That's one big win I think Thena's helped with is uh, the SLA notifications when it's breached our time window. I've noticed that it'll surface back and say, uh, do you want to close this? Or this has actually breached your SLA. Do you want to get back to it? So it's really nice to have that push notification to remind me, uh, actually, I need to get back to this. Or, oh, wait, was that thing closed? okay, it was, right? Or I see that someone else on my team is on it. I actually can reassign it to them. Uh, and so I think having that management system right in Slack has been really helpful. Um, the other key win for us, we have a lot of product releases that are coming out. And one area that I'm trying to get better at in terms of education and also engaging customers is letting people know, hey, we have all this really exciting stuff use it, try it, talk to us. And we've found so much value out of the marketing automation side of Thena as well, because before we, it would take a lot of cycles to put together a marketing automation email right now. Um, some of that's falling on CS's plate and we'd go through HubSpot and sometimes we'd mess up. And then we were like, oops, we're disregard that email. We're going to send another one. Uh, and now it's like, actually, we can do that in Slack. We can better track engagement and we can re-engage folks, I think, where they're working, right? Uh, and we can tell, okay, people are actually really excited about these new things that we've been working on. We're not just kind of going into this silo of email. Uh, and I'm sure plenty of people get so many product updates over email. I think it's different. If it's a different experience to do that in Slack. And I do think that it helps us get people's attention and it, they remember, they're like, oh, I have this channel with user evidence. Oh, that's super cool that they just released these like new features or that they're thinking about, um, you know, this new MPS type of workflow or, or whatever we're trying to announce that month. Um, so yeah, those are the two, I think, big pieces is like this push notification element and the ability to, for me, delineate urgency and also have transparency into what my team's doing. And then second is this one-to-many automation, education, CS engagement that we've been able to use Thena for. Yeah. The, uh, it's awesome. And you've touched a lot of different parts of the, of the product. Um, I want to keep an eye on time and in a few minutes, I want to switch to some of the 
can't, uh, the questions from the audience, but a couple things I want to hit on. Um, you touched on kind of keeping track of those requests and making sure they don't get lost and you get reminders of them. For me personally, that's even something that I use every single day where I'll reply to a customer and then I will go back and look at my queue. It's not really a formal ticketing system, but the queue uh, of just making sure everything's getting addressed because I'll often forget, oh, I forgot I needed to reply to June about something. Um, I just found one this morning that we released a feature this week and I knew that there was a customer that had asked for it three months ago but I couldn't remember who it was. And I went into our on hold status, went and found it. And then I replied to that thread where they asked for it and said, hey, we just released this. And they said, this is amazing, love it. Like I never would have remembered that. I can't remember the conversation that I had three months ago. So I think that's been really great. And then the, um, yeah, you touched on urgency and kind of like being able to summarize the threads. And I think as you scale, that becomes increasingly uh, valuable where you don't need to be in every single channel, right? You talked about, having a few dozen channels scaling to a hundred customers over a hundred customers doesn't scale for you to be in every single one of those channels, but being able to see the alerts coming in the notifications, then you can keep an eye on what's urgent, what's, what's important. So I think you hit on some of the real key value things. Um, what do you think is missing? What, what would you like to see? Where do you see this world going? Um, if you had a magic wand, what would you say? I would love to have this tomorrow. Mm -hmm. One thing in the short term I know you all are thinking about is how we can bring email into Slack or Slack back into email because people, there are going to be people that use email only and that's okay. And I think we should meet them where they, where they are. And also I think we should be able to choose the workflow like Slack that we want to work in. Right. So I think, I know you all are, are working on that and thinking about that. Um, I think I'd be remiss to not talk about some level of AI involved here in terms of uh, like one thing that I actually uh, think is really important. I talked about keeping support and CS human, but there is this element of, there's probably someone out there already who has asked the same question, right? From, because when we onboard and implement hundreds of customers, they're probably gonna have similar friction points. We're going to have help center articles for it. We're going to have community posts about it, but they're still going to ask that question. And so I know a lot of live chat and ticketing tools kind of think about this element of surfacing that knowledge, right? Where customers are asking it. I would love for Slack or Athena to be thinking about that, right? Like how do you integrate with someone's help center? How do you actually pull from prior customer conversations um, is there this level of intelligence where we can say, okay, I've user evidence has had 20 conversations about how to send out this type of a survey. Like, can you actually, when another customer asks it, can you actually, instead of, you know, me answering, can you actually first surface those other customer uh, touch points, right? Or like those conversations and say like, does this help answer your question? Uh, and then if it's like, oh, it actually doesn't, you can still talk to June or you're, you're still gonna be in the Slack channel, but there's level, this level, I, I don't really like deflection, but there's this level of like educating people about what they wanna know kind of in the moment. So yeah, I think from a support side, that would be really cool. Um, from a CS standpoint, I also wonder if um, this somehow could be embedded into the product a little bit more, right? Like uh, we can understand product usage and that would, kind of give us notifications in Slack to say this customer is not doing well or they're doing amazing. Um, so I think it's just like having Slack talk to all other tools that you're using that would inform like renewal conversations or QBRs. I think that would be really powerful. So um, I, that one's less baked out, <laughs> but like, yeah, there's this element I think of like connecting to the customer, giving them proactively what they're asking for and also being able to provide them value proactively like all with Slack kind of being that core heartbeat of it. Uh, so excited to see where you all end up. Uh, this is a really, I think, green space, at least for, for me um, in CS and support. So I, I think Slack is the, the future of work. I think that that's proven itself true. And so really excited to see where Athena goes with that.
I love that Slack is the future of work. It, it's it's the thesis that we're basing us on, and it goes beyond Slack, right? You mentioned Teams earlier starting to come up a little bit more. Um, I think that'll continue to be to increase, and I think just in general, this concept of messaging platforms is a way in which B two B communication happens. Um, yeah, you touched on the AI piece and the knowledge base piece. Uh, touches on Connor's question in the Q and A. And yeah, I do, I do envision that that will be a very soon future state where customers can get some of their things self-resolved by using AI to tie into your knowledge base and maybe previous questions and answers that that same customer has asked in the past. So really excited about that and really excited about the email to Slack flow and being able to close out that loop as well. Because like you said, there's, there's still some portion of customers that are emailing you. So why don't we switch over to customer questions, and we'll probably run a little bit past, you know, 45, uh, just because there's some great questions in here. Carlos asked a question that I, I wanted to get your take on, which is how do you use Slack and Slack communications as a competitive advantage? Do you see it as a competitive advantage in the space more generally? Yes, uh, I think this goes back to this decision that often customers have between vendors when Often, well, one of our main competitors is called Tech Validate. I'll just name them. Um, and they're actually a subsidiary of SurveyMonkey. And I think people will come to us and say, ah, oh, we've used Tech Validate in the past, yet we want more. And I think first and foremost, our product is going to be a differentiator. I would say very close to then product is our team, is our people. It, and those go hand in hand, right? It's like, I haven't been heard by this company or I'm looking for innovation and I want my feedback to be taken into account when thinking about new features or problems I'm looking to solve. And I think our founders have been, Ray and Evan have been really um, eager to listen and actually act on that. And so I think that Slack is not like, we're not advertising that as like, oh, you get access to us in Slack, right? Like that's not going to be on our feature set. But what is on our feature set is you get to work really closely and partner with our CS team. And yeah, okay, whatever communication channel you want is a part of that. And also we typically work in Slack, but also we'll meet you where you are, right? So I would say it's not like the thing that we're putting on our website, but I think it is such a core part of our culture of listening to the customer of like creating those relationships and of really ensuring that we're building for our users. I love that. I love that. <clears throat> I think it is a huge competitive advantage. I think not only is it beneficial to the company as well as the, the customer, but I think it differentiates. And I've heard some companies offer it as a kind of differentiator and that they won. Some of our customers have won deals simply because they offered Slack as a way to engage with them versus their competitors that didn't. So I think it's a huge advantage. Cassie asked a question about, do you have any kind of strategy, policies, guidelines of how your team, whether it be the, you know, the CX team or the broader product and engine team uh, is expected to communicate with customers or not communicate with customers in Slack channels? Because obviously people can join public Slack channels, they can get in there and anyone can jump in. Do you, do you set any restrictions or not yet? Uh, not yet. More, It's more so around how we're establishing the Slack channel to start, right? Um, I think we, we haven't gotten to the stage where we need a lot of red tape around it. Um, it's like, I want them to be public. I think that's that's one thing. And then also it's like, be professional, but I think that that's pretty baseline for us. Um, or be personal too, right? Like uh, be, be yourself, uh, I think is definitely something I emphasize, but no, we don't have that yet. Um, Cassie, I could see that being important though, as your company grows and as you say, uh, this is actually what enterprise customers get. This is what SMB customers get in terms of even time to first response or prioritization. But no, right now we don't have um, anything super built out, but I bet Mike, you probably have some customers that do. Yeah, we we uh, might have a few. I think uh, we we tend to keep it kind of ver very ad hoc as well, but we try to limit how many product and engine people are in customer facing channels because 
more often we see that if they reply to a customer, that customer will sometimes then contact them directly or try to send them a DM. And we try to push everyone back to the, the Slack channels because when it's in the Slack channels, we keep it tracked. It's in the system. We have analytics around it. We have metrics around it. And then often we can collaborate on it more effectively. So definitely, definitely a pain point with Slack, but something that we try to keep, keep thoughts on. Um, any final advice, tips, best practices, or things that you want to share with the audience, Jim? This has been a great conversation. I think you covered a lot. Um, I, I think I've just really loved growing my career working with customers. Like I, I would say that for anyone out there that um, is just thinking about business or thinking about who to work with and for, it's like I. I think when business people and leaders really are thinking about who are we serving and what do they care about inside of work, outside of work, um, I, I think that's really where a lot of this value and just like longevity can really happen, uh, especially in the software bloat. So many tools do the same thing, right? <laughs> um, I do think people obviously are differentiating and building, but um, so much of, I think, how we spend our work day is around people. And yeah, I think that's sort of my takeaway is like the customer uh, should always be at the center of what you do. And I think always thinking about who you're serving and why you're serving them is, is so important. And I think something you commented on earlier is also meeting them where they, where they are, meeting them where they want to work. If they're in the web, meet them on the web. If they're in email, meet them on email. If they're in Slack, meet them in Slack. And that's going to enable you to build a stronger relationship with them as well. Wonderful. June, this was amazing. Really appreciate you taking the time to share your experiences, your insights uh, with the with the audience here. So thank you for spending the time. For everyone that's listening, again, user evidence, uh, definitely take a look at it. We are customers of user evidence as well. We love it for user reviews, quotes, et cetera. Uh, it's been really helpful. So thank you, June. Thank you, Mike. It's been great. All right. Bye, everybody. June, if you can hang around for an extra minute. Everyone else, take care.